clean Titus today. And in the days to come, if all goes well. A couple of, I guess, opening remarks just about the way I intend to approach this. I Learning curves really aren't just a single curve. And so you feel like there's times where you're learning a lot, then you stagnate for a while, and you learn some more. And, uh, wherever I am in the curve, at the moment, my curve feels like the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. So in the past, when I've covered a particular topic, I've tried to be my version of exhaustive. And later on, I have learned that neither was I exhaustive nor necessarily helpful to the overall process. So <clears throat> as I approach Titus, I am not going to be remarkably thorough, at least from my perspective as it exists right now. In addition, when it comes to some background on Paul and all that, Dad covered that with Timothy pretty well, and so I won't be covering that to great detail right now. But still, an introduction to Titus, it is from Paul, probably in Macedonia, uh, to Titus, who is a Gentile. Let's look at these, though, really quickly. Galatians, uh, referring to his background. So he's talking about the Council of Jerusalem. It was because of a revelation that I went there and I submitted to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So obviously Brady's there as a Gentile. He's called a fellow worker in 2 Corinthians by Paul. Second Corinthians 8.23 As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brethren, they are messengers of the churches of glory to Christ. It's also referred to as a comfort uh, in 2 Corinthians 7, six. For God who comforts the depressed comforted us by the coming of Titus. And then if you look in verse 13 and 14, for this reason we have been comforted, and besides our comfort we rejoice even much more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. So uh, the comforter being comforted. In 8.16, but thanks be to God who puts the same earnestness on your behalf in the heart of Titus. So Titus has talked about more than a lot of them. And Titus is in Crete at this time, obviously in the book of Titus itself, verse 5 chapter 1. For this reason I have left you in creed that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I have directed you. This is what I know about Titus at this point. The date probably around the same time as 1 Timothy. This book has been written. Um, I can't even remember where I found this, but the events mentioned in the book are believed to have taken place sometime to taken place 62 27, somewhere in that period. No, 67, sorry. Let me, you know, I should put that. 62 to 67, somewhere in that five-year period. And that wouldn't make sense. The theme and purpose of Titus, God's grace, our faith, and good works. Grace is mentioned numerous times in 1 verse 4. To Titus, my true child, in a common faith. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. He set that off pretty quickly. 2.11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. 3 7. So that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And then verse 15. All the, well, this is just the, the end greeting. Uh, those who are with me greet you, greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. So, a discussion about uh, grace takes place, faith as well. First, we just read it in 3 15. In 1 1. The faith of the chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godlessness, is the basis of the letter. To begin with, verse 4. We read that already. 2.10. Showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every aspect. In verse 13 as well, chapter 2. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God. Oh, the word hope there is also faith. And good works are discussed. Uh, One sixteen, they profess to know God, but in their deeds they deny Him. Verse twenty-seven, 
uh, well, no, not 27. There is no 27. Look at verse 14 of chapter 16, 20, oh, 2-7 is probably what that's supposed to be. In all things, show yourselves to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine and dignified. 3-5, he saved us not on the basis of our work, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. And then verse 8, those who have believed in God will be careful to engage in good deeds. In verse 14, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful or without work. So the letter is a letter of instruction, kind of outlining the different sections. It concerns elders in verses 5 through 9, which you covered in Timothy, and I'll be spending some time on as well. Uh, false teachers are discussed in verses 10 through, boy, I do this everywhere, 10 through 16 of chapter 1. And then it starts kind of getting into subcategories or subsets. I, I was thinking of a special interest groups uh, in chapter 2. The whole of chapter 2 kind of covers male, female, younger, older, that kind of thing. And then the believer's responsibilities in 1 through 11, sort of wrapping up the thoughts from chapter 2. I want to make some obvious applications here very quickly. Uh, let us encourage communication. This is a letter from Paul to Titus. And I, I think there's something helpful in recognizing the fact that it exists at all. Obviously, we benefit greatly from it, but rather than a letter to the congregation, this is a letter to an individual, obviously it would have been shared. Uh, but the point is, is that we have one fellow worker writing a letter of encouragement to another based on the things that he is dealing with where he is at that time. So, do we know comforting fellow workers? Well, I should hope so. If we don't, why not? Now, I don't think that really applies to us, but we should. And if we are a Christian, that they say no man is an island. Um, this sort of is the concept here. We should be um, well aware of our relationship with and the status of our, our brethren, and we should be communicating with them. If we do know brethren, do we owe them a letter? And that's sort of what I'm asking here. Are we making sure that we're communicating? Let's not just encourage communication, but let's communicate encouragement. Are we comforting the fellow worker? that we know with Titus at least three times there from 2 Corinthians he was pointed out as being comforter as well as comforted one verse mentioned that as well so I can go to any number of verses to discuss that what our responsibilities to each other are but this is the point that is being made here we are supposed to comfort one another if we are not comforting one another why aren't we doing that what is hindering us from accomplishing that are we personally encouraging and edifying in other words is what I do in the pulpit here edif edifying I should hope so but that's not really what I'm discussing here. The point is, we should be working with one another one-on-one -on -one to be encouraging and edifying. I will pause here before I get into the book. Any comments? Anyway, other than on at least two, if not three mistakes, I need to fix in my slideshow. Paul's greeting, one, one through four. Lee doesn't generally do this, but I'd like other people to read. Jonathan, would you like to start reading one, one through four? Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, and hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my true child in the common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. I should have said, can you read the first sentence? <laughs> Isn't that what's going on here? I thought so. Yeah, yeah. Basically, I mean, he's got more. But. Okay, so he, in his letter, uh, in his greeting here to Titus, he's covering a couple different personalities. First, about God. He says God never lies, promised eternal life, and has a purpose, purposeful timing for our benefit. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Also, that he existed before the rest of us. So, some things to consider when you look at what he says here about God. In Paul's reading, he manages to affirm numerous principles that were often contradicted by religious viewpoints. So, the absolute morality of God, which is not the approach of Greek and Roman theology to their gods whatsoever. If you think about it, can you think of Greek and Roman gods that sin, fornicate, murder, jealousy? The Greek and Romans have a perspective of their gods that basically puts, you know, kind of, well, I mean, it is exactly what happened. Man created the gods in the image of man. <laughs> Uh, rather than the other way around. 
But one of the things he points out right off the top, and so this this is to an extent what Titus would have been well aware of growing up. This is the way gods are, right? Uh, not that he needs to. It's always good to hear it again. I'm not suggesting that Paul is trying to convince Titus of something he doesn't already know, but he's the thing that's what was our God. Never lies. He is he is superior, he is true, he is the real God. When he talks about the promise of eternal life, who would he perhaps um, whose nose would he bend out a joint pointing that out right off right at the offset? Jews, maybe? Yeah. And, and more, maybe more specifically, the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection. Okay, I don't know exactly what what implications they gain um, from having that opinion, uh, but certainly they're not looking around for an opportunity to. But yes, the, the Jews as a whole would not be happy with that statement overall. Uh, purposeful timing for our benefit. The hope of eternal life, which God, this is verse 2, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. So purposeful timing for our benefit. I'm getting ahead here. What am I so the manifestation of a preconceived plan to benefit man. And again, as I was doing some research into, I have some research, some review of the 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 prevailing social opinions of the time when it comes to religion. Um, the, the Romans' perspective of what gods are there for just sort of blows my mind. They would have adopted Ares, the god of war, for example, who is described as manslaughter. That's one of the things that his name sort of means. You know, he goes out and kills as many human beings as he possibly can. And again, the point being, in contrast, we have a god who wants good things for us rather than bad things, who we only need to fear for disobeying him, not regardless. Uh, he also immediately addresses the issue of his inspiration here as we continue. Oh, that's why that's happening. Gotcha. So, Paul entrusted with the word. Um, I'm trying to use this new format here. I'm not really familiar with it. Hopefully this will get better. If you remember from Galatians 1, for example... Paul, an apostle, not sent from man, nor through the agency of man, or 1 Corinthians 11. He's dealing here with the concept of our, the, the perhaps false super apostles. Uh, but the point that he ultimately is trying to make about himself is the same. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5. That's not 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5. It's, um, well, I lost it again. I typoed it. Okay, where's the conversation about the super apostles, James? 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Oh, I do have that correct. I'm just reading it incorrectly. I was going to say 2 Corinthians 11. 11, 5 of 2 Corinthians. I consider myself not the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. What did Paul deal with all the time when it came to his apostleship? You aren't one. You aren't one. And so very quickly here, I think he's pointing out in verse 3, the proclamation which I was entrusted with according to the commandment of God our Savior. He's again making it clear, not that Titus needs it specifically, but I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle. So he's pointing out these things about God, and now he moves on himself. I've been entrusted with the word which this God has given to us, the God has given to us. He has been commanded by God. And then he mentions Titus and some, some points about Titus, a true child in the common faith. So he covers everybody that's involved in this letter at this point, himself, God, and Titus. I have to move on again to elders. Uh, so we moved on to the question of elders, which is why he left Titus in Crete. Verse 5 uh, through, let's let's go ahead through 9. Dad, you read 5 through 9. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered, or a drunkard or violent, or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. 
We must hold firm to the trustworthy word is taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. My first note here is to myself. I'm going to tell you guys what it says, so that you're aware of where I'm coming from here. All caps. P. George. Ask honest questions, honestly. So I'm going to camp out here at least for the rest of class. Um, and I, I want to... I want to approach some things in here from the aspect of we might know what we believe, but can we defend it? And some of this is more George knows what he wonders, but can is it legitimate a legitimate question to ask? So let's look at some things here. Elders in every town. My first question would be: Can elders deal with more than one congregation? If there are more than one congregation in one town, is more one than one congregation in one? 1 Peter 5, let's look at that very quickly. This has been suggested to me before. Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also in the glory that is to be revealed to shepherd the flock of God among you. So I, I would ask again, how confident are we that the among you doesn't mean those among you in the city? As opposed he, was, to he, was, he was speaking of many, First Peter was, was addressed to many areas. It wasn't just one city. That's very good. In other words, it would apply to numerous congregations, but not yes. the numerous congregations as a whole, the numerous congregations right. individually. Right. Because there's one, two, three, four, five least five different areas. Right. So it, it couldn't have just, he, he couldn't have been the Pope, per se. Right. Mr. Tweedy. Well, we call his first preaching journey when he's returning in Acts chapter 14. He says when they came back, this is verse 23, so when, so when they had appointed, I mean, they're strengthening the souls of the disciples on their return from going through the cities, okay? They had come back Verse 22, they're strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying we must remain tribulations and pertain to God. It's interesting. I'll stop right here for a second. Paul just got stoned. Right. Yeah. He's like, wow. <laughs> okay. Um, so when they had appointed elders in every church, praying and fasting, he commanded them to, to work. So every church doesn't say that I commanded you in this city so that you can be over many churches in many Perfect. Yeah. yeah, I'm just going to say that we're, we're jumping over one step in this process here, Okay, I think, and, and this is a great verse to hear you brought up. Is there any ambiguity in Titus chapter 1 about the question? And honestly, I think you say yes. There's an ambiguity there, but there is enough specis, spec, uh, specificity, 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 specificity. <laughs> Specificity. Okay. That's a word. In other places, in the same situation, to clarify, to remove any doubt. Whatsoever. In other words, there's there's an assumption to be made when it says city, but there's an equal assumption to be made if you're going to assume that there's more than one congregation in every city. Right. That you're you're basically sticking your neck out the same distance in Titus to to make to make the argument one way or the other. So. Right. We're not talking the 90s and here. There's sometimes now. two churches in a region, but you you know, see to the two churches in Philippi, right? Right. <laughs> Some other verses that I thought related to this a little bit. First Timothy three, verse five. Obviously in that conversation that he has with Timothy about elders. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? I believe here, yeah, this this was the Ecclesia, sort of referring to the uh, church universal rather than just one specific. So, elders have responsibility to that congregation, but that congregation represents a part of the whole. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying there's a gray area there, but those those concepts are used pretty pretty tightly together, uh, which, which would indicate to me from Titus that we don't need to be freaking out about the possibility of him suggesting a Hierarchy. Also, Matthew 16, which whenever I run into this word, 
before Acts. I get a little interested. Matthew 16, verse 18. Oh, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. The same, the same word there, church, being used as a description of Christ's body without necessarily talking about a specific congregation. Obviously, those have not been established yet. So, so the idea of the Lord's house and, and stewardship taking place there. I'm going to move on to my next question. Are we ready? Oh, we're doing what's going to be. My dad, you can have my slide. The word anyone. Uh, yeah. Namely, if any any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and, and then he goes on to the thing. So before we continue, whatever the qualifications are, is any man who meets these qualifications required to be an elder? No. And why would you say that? Because I would say that too. It's it's a, like, it's, it's a as in, uh, first first Timothy. This is a it's a opportunity. It's not a commandment that they have to be forced to. It is it is something that is okay, let me go to first here. But this is a honorable First Timothy three one. Mm-hmm. If a man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work that he desires. Yeah. So even if it's not explicitly stated in Titus, I think we can assume that one of the qualifications would be that you want it. Exactly. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, you just talked about this in First Peter five. Mm-hmm. Uh, verse two is that shepherd walk with God, which is one of you serving as overseers, not by constraint, right? Willing. Right. Mm-hmm. Position that is willing is sought for the shepherd house. And this creates an interesting element to to the selection and creation of leadership because I, I guess some of the best men that I can think of are elders and I can imagine I can think of many more who are not and the possibility exists there that it's because they don't feel like they're qualified or they simply feel like that burden is too great for them and, and in the world leadership is sort of determined by who wants to be there I, I don't know of anybody who is president or king without really wanting it, other than in movies where you meet these princes and stuff that really, really are been out of shape or whatever it is. But generally speaking, people come to power because they were seeking it. So in contrast to that, we'd expect a person who is not seeking it. However, it is something to be sought after all. It is something that you are to desire to want after all. The, there's the saying that ten pressed people are, aren't worth as much as one volunteer. And I, I think that's a little bit vital here. And one of the reasons I bring it up, and this is not to uh, specifically condemn everything that I see going here. In fact, I'll have some positive things to say about them later. But one of the things I've learned since I'm marrying Chance is that one of the things that they'll do in Mennonite congregations is that when they decide uh, they need an overseer, whether, whether it be on a uh, like a more of a deacon role, or a, of course, they divide things up a bunch of different ways that I don't fully understand. But basically, it, when they're looking for elders, they nominate people a little bit more loosely compared to the standards. And then those people, to varying degrees of desire, if the straw gets chosen, because they draw straws and it falls to one, and whether that one really wanted it or not, guess what? That's, that's what they do now. And that's not a pattern that I, I think is represented. Scripture very well. Well, you can't find somebody drawing straws. Well, but yeah, you can find somebody drawing straws. See, this is this yeah. one of the things that I'm saying is that why, if you have three qualified people, can only one of them take a leadership role? That's something else that I run into with, with that, a question I have had. But it is certainly something people do. They're kind of, um, you don't you don't put yourself forward as an option. The rest of the church puts you forward, and there's is there a vote to see? It, okay, these three guys, do we have enough support behind these three to even put them up for something like that? Uh, not, the, not the biblical example here. And if there were three qualified men, I'd like to think all three of them would 
Mm-hmm. Can you imagine doing that here if we had Sewell Hall and if we had three Sewell Halls and only one of them with me an elder? <laughs> uh, so if you're qualified, you have a choice. I would say yes, you do, uh, based upon what we've just discussed. So above reproach, let's, let's go back to First Timothy again. Y'all knew it was coming. First Timothy five and verse nineteen. Do not receive an accusation against an elder, except on the basis of two or three witnesses. So in Titus, when we have this conversation about above reproach, obviously an accusation would be a reproach, would it not? Hey, you are. We're, we're considering elders. This person has been brought forward, and I'm a, I have a reproach against this man. My accusation against him is this. Okay. So speaking very practically here, if somebody is presented to the church, and one person and one person only says, "I saw this man do this thing," would disqualify him. If there is only one witness or one one accuser, would this proceed? Or do we let it go for the sake of a brother who's uncomfortable with the situation? John? The problem here is this person's already an elder. Right? That's true. All right? yeah. That's the difference. And if it was me, and I'm the one being accused again, because I know it's true, uh, but um, uh, this is, uh, as a role of an elder, you take a lot of things into your responsibility. You have to examine yourself. Probably more closely than some of us really do sometimes. And we have to be more humble if we're really ready for that role. So he's not, in perhaps in perhaps this election, certainly this person would not be an elder yet. However, all the way back into Deuteronomy, if you turn to Deuteronomy 19, the concept of having more than one witness before a person is considered guilty. And see, the thing that really amazes me about this is this is God's rule, but God knows. <laughs> Um, so this is this is obviously something that we have patterned our justice system off of to some extent, or at least we used to. That this rule by mob seems to be becoming quite a thing um, all of a sudden. But 1915, a single witness shall not rise up against a man, and this is not talking about any special men, a man, on the account of any iniquity or sin which he has committed, on the evidence or of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. Um, and I'm just reading that to suggest that true, perhaps not an elder yet, but the principle seems to apply regardless. If we have an individual who is being presented as eldership material and somebody objects, but only one person objects, but nobody can confirm or support that objection, what do we do, John? Well, and also, the duty of that man who saw this should have went to that fellow preacher to begin with. There's a, there's a privately, uh, uh, I mean, uh, secretly. I mean, uh, well, I'll privately uh, first, because there is that. We have all this stuff to do. It was his responsibility. Hey, I saw you do this. And it could have been something not a sin. And so uh, what I would suggest to that is that this very quickly becomes couched in the specifics of the situation, because perhaps in my hypothetical, this is addressed very rapidly by the person who's being considered for an elder. Yes, I... You did come to me about that. We discussed it, and uh, and and I came out of that with the understanding that I had done no wrong, and that we were in a disagreement about this. You know, mm-hmm. my wife interprets First Corinthians eleven differently than you do. Right. You know, that kind of right. thing might be happening. Right. Um, again, what I'm really trying to get to here is is when the day comes, Lord willing, uh, if there is a single objection, how would you apply that here? It's just a question I haven't really heard before. Right. Um, and, 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 and every man that is being, I mean, I know of a, I know of an older man who would make an excellent elder. Not here. Mm-hmm. And, and he would do his name because somebody said something about something about him. And he said, I do not want to, you know, it's a problem. It's one thing if, uh, the above reproach, if somebody in the community says something that's true. You or somebody in the congregation. That's true, which is probably a lot of what Titus is referring to. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think there's 
somebody in the community would look differently than I do. They might say something that, you know, can't not be made. And the person who is being presented for being established as an elder is theoretically already qualified, even if he is not in that position yet. So presumably the wisdom will already be there to handle that situation appropriately, even if he will not become an elder, because he will know he will be mature enough and wise enough to, to know what to do with that situation. Above reproach, we, I guess we looked at a little bit. So has he never faced an accusation at all from the community? Lord, if you have ever once, do I mention this here? I think I, I think I bring it up later. Let me, let me skip ahead for a minute. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, no. Does this mean he never faced an accusation at all? I'll leave it in that for a second. We're going to come back to this. Impossible, right? That's right. That's impossible. We, we'd all love to have Jesus in here, yeah. right? <laughs> John, you got a 33 arrests, but no convictions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't probably um, not. But if you've got someone who he's white, so he's a Nazi. Right. That's irrelevant. That, that doesn't even fact. That's not what this is talking about. Yeah, and you, you made the comment, you know, Jesus, Jesus gets accusations all the time, all the time. <laughs> so I think we are in Titus here. We can fairly safely assume that Paul is sort of referring to the outside things, such as above reproach. Well, I mean, is he reproaching the community? No. Well, accusations. Are we talking about any old community accusation? Probably not, because they aren't informed of what they're responsible for. So I think both are being considered here just as we're discussing them. John, did you have something additional to know? Probably all seen the thing online about uh, Paul's resume from applying yeah, that's right. for a preaching position. Yeah. Have you yeah. ever seen this? Or, yeah. yeah. Well, I've been chased out of several different towns and stolen once or twice and arrested a bunch of times, and I'd like to be a preacher. <laughs> kind of like Noah's permit to build the ark with the DC. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's another good one. Uh, Okay, the husband of one wife. Now, I've heard some of these questions before, so I won't necessarily go over them. My dad covered them fairly thoroughly, as I recall. I think I just started coming in here at that point. But the, what, what if he's been what if he's been widowed and yeah. married again? What if he didn't remarry after he was widowed? Is he still qualified? No matter how... This, this one is about as as measurable as any of the qualifications, and it still leaves room for some consideration. And so that just makes me want to recognize the fact that these, to some extent, are judgment calls. You know, not to mean that we can make a judgment that would obviously be clearly outside of the realm of those qualifications, but does he meet these qualifications? 99.9% .9 of the people in this congregation believe he does. Okay, and he was widowed and remarried and has been remarried 30 years and he has the purpose of these things are to format qualifications that present somebody that's clearly qualified that there's no questions there in terms of the maturity that's involved that the knowledge is there that the experience with family is there Jonathan um, you, you, um, you said this one's about the most measurable it, it, you know, there's still some kind of things where you could say oh well you know, the widow situation or the situation, but at a basic level, it is the most measurable. It's binary, husband of one wife or not. Right. Yeah. And yet, still, the one I think that people do the most dodging to try to get around is, you know, he doesn't have to be married yet. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and often it's, um, like, you know, somebody at a church up here, well, I, I accepted the position. I was going to be married soon. Well, you know, I knew I was going to be above reproach soon. You could, you I knew could, I was going to be not open to the charge of debauchery soon, I, I was going to get that one cleared away. You could almost do that argument to excuse my patient. We will right. be married pretty soon. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I will be upright, holy, and disciplined soon. Yeah. Yeah. My, my general take on this husband they were dealing with what? What were they dealing with right. then? I mean, come on. The Jews had one wife. Yeah. The Greeks, they got three They didn't care. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, oh. right. So, okay, one, one. Mm -hmm. See, and and today, if you think about it, if you have if you have a man in his late 60s, okay, 
that was married and lost his wife at 42, and then married again at 45, and he's been married to her ever since. Have you ever had, sir, more than one wife? Well, no. I mean, he's, he's only ever, you know, have you been, but I've been married twice. You know, however, a man who's e even, well, certainly, scripturally divorced over a situation got remarried, are we in a situation there where we're willing to, I, I, I feel like that is a little bit different, yeah. because there was a judgment call involved there that may not have been excellent. Now, perhaps the man is blameless anyway, and perhaps that decision would still be made anyway. However, that presents to me more cause to pause right. than the, the fact that he married a wife that ultimately died of cancer, because that is, that is not a, right. well, I, I just didn't realize that she was going to be so awful until I married her, and that she, you know, well, I mean, you're supposed to be able to, kind of, out of everybody in the group, certainly, you're the one who ought to be able to judge personalities and understand how to respond to people, and we're not asking you to read hearts, but this is something that perhaps you could have done better with, are we comfortable letting somebody lead us who made a really poor choice with his first wife? I, I would ask that question at that point. But again, and I'll, I'll address this just a little bit more in a moment, these, these questions these aren't, these aren't higher, faster, stronger, what's the phrase, from the Olympics. These aren't things that you can mark a score off. Uh, they, they hit a 55 and therefore they qualify. You know what I'm saying? Above reproach is something that you investigate, you look into. You don't go and say, yep, he, he, he scaled a 69 on this and so therefore he's passed the bar. Children are believers. So, so the question I'd ask again, if you have Believing children who fell away as middle-aged adults. Are you qualified? Did you raise them as you were supposed to? Are the parents responsible for the sins of the children? Certainly not. If, if a man had children who never became believers, I, I think that's fairly clear. If you have a man whose children did not become believers until after they had been through a car wreck in their middle age and become a Christian, oh, they believe now that we can make this man up. Well, he didn't teach his children, you know. So they might be believers now, but again, we're in a, we're in a judgment call situation. What's going on with this person individually? If he had all his children believed and two of them fell away in their fifties, you know, you look at the other seven and you go. Fortunately, I'm not the one, certainly in this congregation, to be making those judgment calls on behalf of somebody else. So. But there are things I wonder about. So, 5 through 9, he starts listing some things that an elder should not be. Arrogant, which is self-willed. In fact, it's amazing how, as we look at these, all of them have some version of self associated with them, if you look at the word. And I didn't list them all up there, but really... You can find a way to apply all of them to the concept of self. It can. Don't be self-willed. In a position of authority, he must be submissive. Isn't that a little bit ironic, or what do you want to call it? He, he's not supposed to be controlling things for his own gain. He's supposed to be shepherding the flock. This is why the word shepherd is such a great word for this, because that person in authority does nothing but sacrifice himself for the people that he is over. And if you can find a man who has done that, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to... I'm going to start looking for Old Testament characters that fit these qualifications, and it's tough. It is tough to find someone, just, just for the sake of the exercise. Uh, don't be quick-tempered. So I looked at this word a little quick, closer, more closely. And here's some synonyms. Irascible, dyspeptic, which is a combination of depression and indigestion. Okay? That is called by me immediately. Something else, so. Crotchety, cantankerous, prickly, and peevish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, not quite tempered, and so and some of these things some of these things really really describe what is happening in the outward attitude. So you might be this way, but peevishness is not really oh you're you're peevish on the inside. Never knew. No, you describe peevishness once you see it. 
Uh, so, very knowledgeable, perhaps, but if they are easily peeved, okay, they're not going to be able to stand the frustration of what the office holds. A drunkard? Violent? I mean, who's violent unless you're trying to do something over the will of somebody else? Even if it's for, for justice. Okay, you're doing the wrong thing, I'm going to overpower you so you can stop. That is... I hate to apply the word selfish to that, but that is certainly looking out for a specific interest there. Particularly considering the fact that men men leading a group of people who believe an unpopular thing could pretty quickly rile the group up to inappropriate behavior towards outsiders. You know, if, if you had an elder who had violent tendencies, you know, Roman Tatus, grab your sickle, you know. You know, because you feel persecuted far more than we do now. It'd be very, very quickly be able to lead a group to a point where they are looked down upon or is seen as a, a threat for legitimate and wrong reasons. You know, I mean, yeah, Romans would look at that and say something's wrong here, but then they would not be above reproach anymore. You know, that would suddenly be a, a just accusation instead of an unjust one. Or greedy, obviously, referring to things of self, trying to do this for gain. Uh, there's the discussion, I can't remember the reference, but it's, actually, I do know the reference. It's, I think it's Philippians. Let me see if I've got that correct. I do have that correct. Uh, verse 13. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out if any context. 15. Some to be sure are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some do from goodwill. The latter do it from love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former, out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thank you to cause me to stress in my imprisonment. So do they know the truth? Yes, they do. Is their attitude correct? Is their motivation correct? As they teach it, it is not. Don't let that person be an elder. When I'm enjoying teaching somebody because I'm right and they're wrong, and it's my goal to help them understand that, I'm not qualified. Do be. Do be, do be, do be. Go ahead. Drunkard for a second. Your use is the word drunkard. Uh, one of the ones that I had to use used the word drunkard. Let me see what it says here. Yeah, because the word... I thought I eventually hit that, too. Not addicted to wine. And I think... We're, so... We'll get back to it. Right. Yeah, because there's this word sober here that we're about to touch on. Doobie. Hospitable, which is actually a lover of hospitality, not just, uh, you know, do you pass as hospitable? So again, these are judgment calls, but this one's supposed to be an obvious judgment call. I, I guess for the most part, you know, he has people over twice a year. You know, okay, he's hospitable. We're a little bit too eager, I think, if that was, that was a standard. Not that there's a number. It doesn't say make sure he has people over 15 times a year. But it's supposed to be clear to everyone involved that the person is hospitable. So, just like a lover of hospitality, he's supposed to be a lover of good. Not just good, but very good. And not just good himself, but a lover of other people who are performing good. So the word, the next word here is sober, which is self-controlled, sober-minded, and of moderate opinion, is what this word means. It's a mental state. And based upon what I looked at, I would not go here to have a discussion about alcohol. I wouldn't go to this word. Verse before, I think you can get further with that. But here, see, he's supposed to be sober. I'd, I'd go back to not addicted to wine. Which is what mine says, not addicted to wine. He's supposed to be sober. This, this is a, a sober attitude. This is solemnity. This is not so not right and of, of moderate opinion does that moderate opinion apply to well, a little bit of false teaching in the church I know moderate. you know is, is that what he's saying that word moderate opinion sounds like liberalism I know I know it does just <laughs> moderate opinion um, I suspect it has to do with things that qualify as opinions is, is I guess what I would say in other words false teaching is not something you can have an opinion about but what is opinion? Is this a man who's going to put up a fight with the congregation over the color of the pew? Probably not. 
upright. Uh, this word is just. It comes from the same root as holy. However, this word specifically, if I understand this correctly, you can check me on this. This upright word more addresses the concepts of to, to man's regulation. Is he lawful in the eyes of the world? Is, is he being is he following the speed limit? <laughs> that, that's where that's where this would would be found. There's other words uh, that refer to, to different concepts of holiness that aren't really here. For example, if you go to Revelation 16, this one was interesting to me, and I'm going to have to see how it even puts it in this version. Revelation 16. <laughs> Righteous are, Revelation 16, 5, I heard the angels of God saying, Righteous are you who are and who were a holy one, because you judge these things. That is not the verse I thought was. Who was, I'm looking for the one that says, Who was and is and is to come. You know what I'm talking about? When they're praising him, who was and is and is. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking it's earlier than what I've got. I wonder if it's 1 8. I'll have to check this again. No, it's so that this is very similar, but it's actually where somebody else is saying it about him rather than him saying it about himself. Because there's a phrase there, shall to be. Uh, he, sh he shall be, he, he, he basically the eternity of it, and that phrase shall be is actually another one of our words, holy, and it's referring back to that. But since I'm butchering it at the moment, why don't we just leave it and I'll come back to it, because we are running out of time and we can address this again later. Upright, holy, all of this again. But the point I was trying to make is that the upright here is a different word than the holy that comes right after it. This upright is sort of holiness or or purity in the eyes of the law of man, slightly more so than the second word holy, which is a little bit more vague. That's really what I was trying to bring up with that, and I was going to give you an example of that from Revelation, but obviously you can find a reference for that <coughs> again. And then we'll stop here with discipline. The word discipline means strong in a thing. Strong in a thing. Be strong in all the things. <laughs> This is a person who's not going to be distracted easily, particularly by people who are teaching a falsehood or who are sinning, who won't be frustrated easily by the uh, less mature. The elder should be the most mature person in the group, hopefully. I mean, if somebody was very mature but disqualified themselves, that, that situation will exist. Person has excellent self control. The purpose of an elder, why don't we just go ahead and stop with those qualifications and I'll review some of them. I'll have a better understanding of what's going on there in Revelation. I, I will fix my other uh, mistakes on the board and we will pick up still there discussing elders next week. We'll break till five. Thank you.